An extract from Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, narrated by Sue Stevens. But this question of love, she thought, putting her coat away, this falling in love with women. Take Sally Seaton, her relation in the old days with Sally Seaton. Had not that, after all, been love? She sat on the floor. That was her first impression of Sally. She sat on the floor with her arms around her knees, smoking a cigarette. Where could it have been? The Mannings, the Kinlock Joneses, at some party, where she could not be certain, for she had a distinct recollection of saying to the man she was with, Who is that? And he had told her and said that Sally's parents did not get on. How that shocked her, that one's parents should quarrel. But all that evening she could not take her eyes off Sally. It was an extraordinary beauty of the kind she most admired, dark, large-eyed, with that quality which, since she hadn't got it herself, she always envied, a sort of abandonment, as if she could say anything, do anything. A quality much commoner in foreigners than in English women. Sally always said she had French blood in her veins. An ancestor had been with Marie Antoinette, had his head cut off, left a ruby ring. Perhaps that summer she came to stay at Burton, walking in quite unexpectedly without a penny in her pocket one night after dinner, and upsetting poor Aunt Helena to such an extent that she never forgave her. There had been some quarrel at home. She literally hadn't a penny that night when she came to them, had pawned a brooch to come down. She had rushed off in a passion. They sat up till all hours of the night talking. Sally it was who made her feel for the first time how sheltered the life at Bortum was. She knew nothing about sex, nothing about social problems. She had once seen an old man who dropped dead in a field. She'd seen cows just after their calves were born. But Aunt Helena never liked discussion of anything. When Sally gave her William Morris, it had to be wrapped in brown paper. There they sat, hour after hour, talking in her bedroom at the top of the house, talking about life, how they were to reform the world. They meant to found a society to abolish private property and actually had a letter written, though not sent out. The ideas were Sally's, of course. But very soon she was just as excited. Read Plato in bed before breakfast. Read Morris. Read Shelley by the hour. Sally's power was amazing. Her gift. Her personality. There was her way with flowers, for instance. At Borton they always had stiff little vases all the way down the table. Sally went out, picked hollyhocks, dahlias all sorts of flowers that had never been seen together, cut their heads off and made them swim on the top of the water in bowls. The effect was extraordinary, coming into dinner in the sunset. Of course Aunt Helena thought it wicked to treat flowers like that. Then she forgot her sponge and ran along the passage naked. That grim old housemaid, Ellen Atkins, went about grumbling. Suppose any of the gentlemen had seen. Indeed, she did shock people. She was untidy, Papa said. The strange thing on looking back was the purity, the integrity of her feeling for Sally. It was not like one's feeling for a man. It was completely disinterested. And besides, it had a quality which could only exist between women, between women just grown up was protective on her side, sprang from a sense of being in league together, a presentiment of something that was bound to part them. They spoke of marriage always as a catastrophe, which led to this chivalry, this protective feeling, which was much more on her side than Sally's. For in those days, Sally was completely reckless, did the most idiotic things out of bravado, bicycled around the parapet on the terrace, smoked cigars. Absurd she was, very absurd. But the charm was overpowering, to her at least. 
so that she could remember standing in her bedroom at the top of the house, holding the hot water can in her hands and saying aloud, She is beneath this roof. She is beneath this roof. No, the words meant absolutely nothing to her now. She couldn't even get an echo of her old emotion. But she could remember going cold with excitement and doing her hair in a kind of ecstasy. Now the old feeling began to come back to her as she took out her hairpins, laid them on the dressing table and began to do her hair. With the rooks flaunting up and down in the pink evening light and dressing and going downstairs and feeling as she crossed the hall, if it were now to die, twere now to be most happy. That was her feeling, Othello's feeling, and she felt it, she was convinced, as strongly as Shakespeare meant Othello to feel it. All because she was coming down to dinner in a white frock to meet Sally Seaton.